Welcome to USS Nautilus Subbrief, SSN 571. Our story begins in 1900. Hyman G. Rickover is born in Russian Poland to a couple Jewish parents who then immigrate to America in 1905. Uh, Hyman G. Rickover is considered the father of the nuclear navy and also the cog, <laughs> the kindly old gentleman. He had uh, a couple negative nicknames in the navy, but uh, we won't go over those. He was uh, simply referred to as the cog later in his life. Um, he did well in school after he immigrated to America and managed to get a place in our Naval Academy. And he graduated the Naval Academy in 1922. His work ethic and study habits as a student uh, were recognized and he was recommended to the CO as a junior officer on board the USS Nevada, a battleship in 1923, where he served uh, a full tour as a junior officer, got to know the CO very well, and that would come back to help him out in his career later on. From the USS Nevada, Rickover went to postgraduate school at Columbia University, where he got his engineering degree. So he's a very intelligent, uh, meticulous, math oriented person. And uh, he sees, as he uh, has experience on the Nevada on a big ship, a battleship, he sees a lot of officers are being promoted quickly on smaller ships and on submarines. So in 1929, he volunteers for submarine duty. But at this time, he's 29 years old and he's too old to volunteer for submarine service. So what he does is he goes back to his old CEO of the USS Nevada and asks him to make an exception to kind of speak up or vouch for him so that he can uh, qualify in submarines and, you know, eventually serve on submarines. And so the CEO of the Nevada, who's moved on as himself, uh, does that for him. And so while Hyman Rickover is working at the office of the inspector of naval material in, Fid in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in 1929, he's also going up to Groton, Connecticut, a couple hours away, and he's qualifying on submarines on S-8, on one of the diesel boats up there, and then he qualifies as submarine command on another submarine and is finished with that inside of about four years. 1933, he is qualified in submarines and submarine command. During this time, not only is he the Office of Inspector Naval Museum, he translates the German's Das Unterseeboot book, which became required reading for the United States Navy Submarine Force. It's basically a book about how to operate diesel boats. He translates that from German to English, and this is before World War II. Okay, so in recognition of his work ethic and uh, everything that he's doing, he is awarded command. He is Captain Rickover at this point, and he is commander of the Finch in the Pacific. It's a minesweeper in 1937. Well, Captain Rickover quickly realizes that he's not built to be a CO. He only lasts about three months on board this minesweeper, dealing with day-to-day -day life on a ship, managing a crew and a wardroom and navigation and all the other things that are involved in managing a ship at sea. He doesn't like doing any of that. He's not very good at it. He volunteers after only three months on board as the captain to become an engineering duty officer, an EDO. And this is a major career shift for anybody in the Navy at that time. If you volunteer for engineering duty officer, you're essentially taking out of the command uh, promotional hierarchy and you're moved over to a more subordinate or a, a supply and support role. And so he's essentially saying, I don't want to be the captain of a, of a ship anymore. I want to be on the repair shipyard engineering side of the Navy. He volunteers for engineering duty officer and that is accepted. Uh, then Commander Rickover uh, works as the Bureau of Engineering in Washington, D.C., 1939. Uh, that's where he has his first EDO or engineering job is in Washington, D.C. And this is significant because this is his first time being stationed in Washington, D.C., where he's meeting the people that outrank anybody in the military. And that's the senators. The senators and representatives of Congress are the people uh, that he begins to hobnob with and get to know and make personal relationships with the people above and outside the chain of command uh, of the Navy or any other service. And this, again, will come back to help him. Of course, in 1941, Japanese attack Pearl Harbor while he's working in Washington, D.C., and he's reassigned to the USS California out in Pearl Harbor to help facilitate the repairs on board that ship. Um, he's kept out in Pearl Harbor for a couple years, 
uh, even though he is eventually relieved on the California, he is then resupplying back to his engineering duty officer duties to the supply depot in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, to investigate insufficiencies or inefficiencies of the supply chain coming out of that base. So he's there in 1944, but the World War is still raging on. He's seeing uh, naval officers that have combat experience are being promoted over those who don't. So he wants to get involved in the invasion of Japan while he's working in Pennsylvania. So he volunteers and is assigned to the repair facility in Okinawa, where he helps begin prepare the U.S. Navy for the invasion of Japan. Japan, logistically, uh, engineering wise, getting all the ships ready, assembling them together in Okinawa, getting ready for the final push when this is finally cut short by the dropping of the nuclear weapons on Japan and the war ending. And this is a full and successful naval career for most people. This is where his naval career would end and he would transition to something else. But in this case, this is where our story begins. At the end of World War II, Commander, now Captain Rickover, has a full over 20 year experience as an, he's an engineering duty officer and he has a successful war career. In 1946, he is assigned to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. This is the laboratory that is trying to turn nuclear energy into a civilian use for power generation. So he's assigned there with a very small team of officers and they're not given very specific goals. But one thing that the Navy wants out of this is they want to learn how they can use nuclear energy to drive the propulsion on their destroyers. And if they can make it work at the destroyer level, the Navy plans on upscaling that to cruisers and eventually aircraft carriers. That's the Navy's big picture. And that's really the only guidelines he has at this time. But Rickover is a submarine officer. And he knows that they can push a submarine under the water with far less power than it takes to push even a destroyer across the surface of the water. So he, on his own, changes his own directives, his own goals to be from creating a propulsion system for a destroyer to propulsion system for a submarine. And this vision is not shared by his admiralty above him and they see it as him undercutting their authority and it's viewed very negatively. So what they do whenever he informs him or they find out through back channels what he's done, they pull him out of Tennessee, out of Oak Ridge, him and his team of officers, just a couple guys, less than 10. Uh, and they remove, if they move him back to Washington, D.C., one where they can kind of keep an eye on this captain who's kind of going off and doing his own thing, not listening to orders. And they give him an advisory role. So he'll be the advisor for nuclear energy to the Navy in Washington, D.C., essentially snubbing him. They're, they don't plan on listening to him. They're just going to let him sit in his office, uh, collect a paycheck until he finally retires. All right. So where does he work in Washington, D.C.? In 1947, he works for the Bureau of Ships. They give him a small office in a corner with his staff and they don't even bother really regularly communicating with him. He, they're just letting him sit there, but he's not having any of it. He's still doing the same job that he was in Tennessee, now in Washington, D.C., working late hours, trying to figure out how to make this propulsion work in a very confined space of a submarine. Well, the Bureau of Ships building is very strict because it works with sensitive material. They have strict work shifts that are eight hours a piece. They have a day shift, an evening shift, and then an overnight shift. Well, he only has passes for him and his team to work during the day shift. So uh, Rickover, Captain Rickover, being a very, you know, hardworking person that likes to work late, tells his team, you know, screw the shifts. We're going to work late every night until we figure out how to make the submarine propulsion work with nuclear power. And they do this for a while without getting caught. And then finally, one night when they're leaving the building, they are caught by security. They're asked for their badges that say they're only supposed to work from you know, morning hours to evening hours, and they're being caught here, you know, eight or nine o'clock at night, violating their, their own security. So this gets reported to the chain of command. Once again, this Captain Rickover is causing problems. He's not obeying, you know, the rules that are set out for him. And what they do, instead of punishing him, because he's a full bird captain at this point, they move him to an abandoned ladies room inside the building, kind of as punishment. They rip out, you know, the toilets and the sinks, and it's this tiled room with just, you know, a little slit of a window to let a little bit of natural light in. 
They move his desk, his chairs, his file cabinets all into this ladies room. And that's where he'll serve in the Bureau of Ships until he decides he wants to retire. Again, they're trying to motivate him out of the Navy. They don't want him anymore. He's causing waves. He's not following rules. You know, he's off doing his own projects instead of what he's told. You know, this guy's, this guy's a maverick. He's a rebel and they don't like that. Okay. So he sends from the ladies bathroom. He finally collects all the data that they have together and they construct a proposal and send it to the chief of naval operations, who is at that time, Admiral Chester Nimitz. Now, one thing about Admiral Nimitz is that he's a submarine officer too. He's actually served on submarines. He's taken them underway. Uh, he's a very successful submarine career. And he's also now the lead Navy person on active duty for the Navy, the chief of naval operations. He reports directly to the president, right? That's his job. So Captain Rickover writes up this proposal, goes directly to the CNO, circumventing the entire chain of command between his position and the chief of naval operations with this proposal to build a nuclear submarine. Chester Nimitz reviews it and it gets returned to Captain Rickover, signed and approved. He has an approved document saying build a nuclear submarine using the ideas that you've researched both in Oak Ridge, Tennessee and here at the Bureau of Ships. And he takes that piece of paper and he's off and running. So where do we build the first nuclear submarine? Well, the first thing Captain Rickover does is he takes his signed CNO piece of paper to the Navy shipyards. You know, he goes to uh, or talks to Mare Island and actually goes to Kittery, Maine, where the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard is. And the Portsmouth Naval Shipyards, you know, they're like, we'll be happy to build your ship, but we already have a full schedule of construction that goes out two or three years. So we'll build it four years from now and we're going to need uh, funding for it as well. And Rickover's like, oh, that's not going to work. We need this. We need this now. You know, we, we have the technology. We have the plans. All we need to do is actually build it. But the Navy is so underfunded, understaffed, and backed up in the naval shipyards, he needs to look outside the naval shipyards. And so we had used some civilian contractors like Electric Boat to build submarines during World War II. And that's very close to Kittery, Maine. It's just down there in Connecticut. He decides to take a little trip down to Electric Boat and talk to the teams down there and they look at us, you know, his approved CNO letter and his plans. And they're like, we can build this. We can actually do this. Uh, we'll, we'll go forward with your project, Captain Rickover. And so they agree to do it, but then the Navy doesn't agree to fund it. This is just another way that they can stop Captain Rickover from doing his Maverick nuclear submarine idea. Uh, he didn't want to play the game and build the nuclear destroyers or research the proper power plants in, in Tennessee. The Navy's certainly not just going to shell out millions of dollars to build this crazy project that he's running away with on his own, going around chains of command, talking directly to the chief of naval operations. They're not going to give him the money, even though he has a signed letter from the CNO. The Navy says that means nothing without dollars behind it. And so instead of going back to the CNO, Captain Rickover does the next best thing. He goes back to Washington, D.C., and he goes to his congressional friends. Uh, he actually speaks before Congress and explains to them the situation that we have this technology, we have this ability, we have a signed letter from the Chief of Naval Operations to build a nuclear submarine. We have a contractor that's ready to do it right there in Groton, Connecticut. And after listening to his pleas, the, uh, the United States Congress does finally approve in July 1951 the construction of the first nuclear powered submarine, not just in America, but in the world. And in June 1952, the U.S. Nautilus SZN 571 keel is laid at the electric boat shipyard before a crowd of about 10,000 people, lots of fanfare, lots of congressmen there because they help pay for it. Do you know who is not invited by the Navy? Captain Rickover. Captain Rickover sits in his ladies' room bathroom office uh, down there at the Bureau of Ships in Washington, D.C., and is not invited to the keel laying ceremony. And the press notices this. The congressmen notice this. And this becomes a big kerfuffle in 1952 that the father of the nuclear navy the person that is pushing this single-handedly practically forward isn't even invited by the navy to the first keeling of his own submarine project something else the navy does because they want to get rid of him is they've passed him over for promotion to rear admiral three times and 
back in 1952 and 53, the policy was if you get passed over three times, uh, you're no longer eligible for promotion. And that is your, in, you know, indication to get out of the Navy. Uh, you can't even become a rear admiral after that, after three times. That's the rule. So what he does is uh, he tells Congress, look, I've been passed over three times. I can't continue on this project as it's beginning in the shipyard because they're going to kick me out of the Navy and I'll no longer be around. Who knows what's going to happen uh, a couple of years from now, whenever the ship is being constructed and there's no more money all of a sudden. So Congress steps in and they talk to the secretary of the Navy. This is another civilian, but he's in charge of the Navy at the very top civilian side. And they hold what's called a special election board for rear admiral. And these are very rare. They don't happen regularly, but they do happen. And so they hold a special election board looking at his career and everything he's accomplished. And they congressionally promote Captain Rickover to Rear Admiral Rickover, again, going around the Navy chain of command. <laughs> and so it's just great to see this very determined guy hell bent on getting his nuclear submarine uh, approved and built despite everybody working against him. Uh, at Rear Admiral Rickover, Admiral Rickover, is an amazing individual, very determined, and a person to be uh, respected and admired. All right, so in January 21st, 1954, the Nautilus is launched. First Lady Mammy Eisenhower launches it into the Thames River right there in Groton, Connecticut. Of course, sands Captain Rickover at the time. In September 1954, uh, it's about nine months later, the Nautilus is commissioned into the United States Navy, and the Navy learned from its mistake and invited uh, then Rear Admiral, or Admiral Rickover to the commissioning. He was there. The 4,000 ton uh, displacement submarine is put out into the water. It is 320 feet long. It's 28 feet wide at its beam, that side to side. Uh, it drafts about 26 feet and has a test depth of about 700 feet. Um, it is refueled multiple times, but the actual reactor vessel itself is a Westinghouse S2W pressurized water reactor that produces about 13,400 horsepower. That turns two shafts, each at five blades apiece. Later on in its career, after some refits and overhauls and upgrades, she will get two seven-bladed screws. But here in the beginning, she has two shafts, five-bladed screws. With these configurations, she's able to transit at 22 knots on the surface, which is pretty good, and even a little bit faster underway at 25 knots submerged. Now, there is a small problem we're going to get into later uh, that keeps her from really maintaining 25 knots for long periods of time, but she is capable of reaching that. Okay, she has six torpedo tubes. They're all in the bow, all forward facing, and they're 21 inch standard 53 centimeter torpedo tubes, which is the standard size for the US Navy. And there's a crew of about 92 men and 13 officers that man this vessel. Underway on nuclear power. So here is the actual message sent from Captain Eugene Wilkinson, who was the first CEO of the USS Nautilus. Uh, it says here, and I'll read from the message from USS Nautilus, SSN 571, to Com Sub Lant, that's Command Submarine Atlantic Fleet, underway on nuclear power, break transmission, which is the shortest, simplest uh, message you could put out there that is so historic that this message is actually kept you know, in, in the annals and museums of, uh, of naval history. This is the moment that the first submarine vessel under nuclear power is underway. And it is at 11.33 Romeo, which is Eastern time, 11.33 Romeo, 17 January, 1955. And uh, that's the logo there to the 571. A little bit of history about the logo of the um, USS Nautilus is that it was designed by Disney Artist. So that's a little bit of Disney work there. All right, so her first transit, her first major transit from New London, Connecticut was to San Juan, Puerto Rico, and it took a record shattering only 89.9 hours. That is the longest submerged crew in his, cruise in history, she did it all in one step. It's also the fastest submerged cruise that was more than one hour. Uh, the fastest transit from New London to Puerto Rico of any surface or submerged vessel. She's faster than any surface ship ha that has done this same voyage, which granted may not be many, but it's still a record in the books. 
All right. So July, August, 1955, she's finally getting into her, you know, job for the Navy. She conducts wartime exercises in Narragansett Bay and off the coast of Bermuda. Narragansett Bay is uh, the body of water that's south of New England, but kind of east of New Jersey. That body of water there, Narragansett Bay. Uh, That's a common operating space for United States submarines. And that's where she was doing her stuff. She demonstrated radical speed increases. They could change speeds quite quickly and get very fast compared to diesel boats. And her endurance had never been seen before by a diesel boat. She could stay submerged for the entire war game, which lasted days if they wanted to. So the ship is fast, capable of, you know, coming in, conducting attack and successfully evading at high speeds. Uh, So this is a whole new class of warfare. This is really getting the attention of the Admiralty now. Not that they're liking, you know, Admiral... Rick over anymore, but they do see what his vision was because they're actually seeing it in war games now and the results are amazing. So the ship is uh, fast and capable, but the USS Nautilus is noisy and the bow shakes over 10 knots. So when anytime she gets up to high speeds, uh, she can't maintain those high speeds for long periods of time because of just, you know, discomfort to the crew and crew fatigue and also damaging equipment. It gets really, really bad at really high speeds. So they're going to go back and take a look at this and see what they can do to future designs and, and try to correct these. One of the things that they're going to do is go to an albacore shape hull, which is the modern shape of submarines today, which is that rounded shape you see in the movies. That's called an albacore shape. All right, so she receives repairs and sonar upgrades in December 1955 based on the findings of these war games that happened over the summer. In 1956, the very next year after these upgrades, she goes down to Key West where she is um, undergone an in-serve inspection. That's an inspection and survey by the Department of the Navy. These are done regularly to every ship in the Navy and every squadron in the Navy has to go through this. And the idea of an in-service inspection or in-serve is to determine any material failures or systemic failures of a specific ship or chain of command uh, that does not get reported to the admiral. So these are the admiral's watchdogs uh, because they know it's human nature to try and hide problems until they're fixed. uh, And the Navy will not accept that, especially whenever it comes to nuclear power. So they have these in-serve inspections that go on board every ship, whether it's nuclear or not, and they do very detailed, meticulous systems readiness checks. So they go through this in-service inspection. They pass it with flying colors, you know, much to the credit of the shipyard building a very first nuclear submarine. And she is for unrestricted service after this, after May 1956, she can go anywhere, do anything the Navy wants. So one of the first things they do is they go up and they refuel her. This nuclear reactor obviously is very small. It has limited life compared to modern reactors and gets refueled pretty regularly. So in February 1957, she goes back up to the shipyard for refuel. She goes to, uh, she returns to electric boat two months for nuclear refuel. This is the uh, shipyard that built her. And then she returns this exercises in April. And I can finally in an unclassified manner, talk about nuclear propulsion of a nuclear submarine. In this case, it's the Nautilus. Uh, This has been decommissioned and this is an old design, but I can finally describe to you in an unclassified way how submarine nuclear reactors work. This is a first. Let's begin. Submarine nuclear reactors have two loops, a primary loop and a secondary loop. Uh, The primary loop if you're watching this is marked in red and you have three major components. You have the reactor, the pressurizer, and the main coolant pump. And this circulates pure water around the reactor, obviously to keep the fuel cool, but makes the water, the pure water, extremely hot. Now to keep the pure water from flashing to steam, it has to be pressurized. So that's what the pressurizer is for. And the reactor coolant pump is simply a circulation pump to keep the water moving over the fuel, keeping the water warm and so forth. The only thing this primary loop does is go to the steam generator. Doesn't do anything else. That's all it does. And the water itself doesn't go to the steam generator. It is just piped inside pipes to the steam generator as you see here. Now the steam generator is part of the secondary loop. The secondary loop has water in it too, but the secondary loop and the primary loop water never mix, ever. They never touch each other. 
they only have contact via the piping that pipes in the primary into the steam generator. So the water from the steam generator gets flashed to steam, as the name would imply, and that steam races down pipes at high energy, at high uh, speed and heat to two places, a turbine generator that makes electricity and the main turbine that turns the screw of the submarine. From there, after it's lost a lot of its energy turning these turbines, it begins to cool down and lose its energy, lose its speed, and it's sent to what's called a main condenser. The main condenser absorbs the rest of the energy in the steam, condensing it back into liquid water at a relatively low temperature. This main condenser is cooled with seawater from outside the boat. Now, the, the secondary and the main seawater systems never mix. They never touch each other either, just like the steam generator never touches the primary, right? So there's no mixing of anything inside the ship's power plant that ever goes out to sea in normal operations. So the seawater just comes in, it provides cooling, it goes back out again, and the steam becomes water and is pumped with what's called a feed bump, pump back into the steam generator. And this is an unclassified description of how the USS Nautilus S2W reactor worked. All right, so after she gets refueled uh, from May to July of 1957, she visits the West Coast. She goes through the Panama Canal, and she spends that summer seeing the cities of the West Coast, San Diego, Long Beach, Portland, Seattle, Tacoma, San Francisco, uh, up and down the coast, you know, doing kind of a goodwill tour. This is a great time for the crew because they get to see all these great cities. This is a big reason why people join the Navy is to go see places that they wouldn't normally see. And so the crew are very happy. Uh, they're conducting tours. They open the ship up to representatives, uh, elected congressmen, and also to the public so they can show the American common person what the Navy has done. This is at this time, 1957, the world's only nuclear submarine that is operational. And so it's quite an achievement, especially in the uh, days of the 50s when uh, Russia was pulling ahead of us in the space program, uh, they would eventually launch Sputnik, which is that little uh, simple satellite that orbited the Earth. And so we were obviously falling behind in a space race. We had the USS Nautilus and this nuclear accomplishment to say, hey, we're doing this and they're not doing it. So we're ahead, you know, in this technology. And this was a big, you know, PR, public relation, you know, underway for them. They went over uh, 3,000 miles and hosted over 13,000 visitors in just a few months and really got the accomplishments of Rick over in the Navy out to the public here. So they're looking for more records to break, more things to do. And uh, the president, the White House, comes up with this idea. Why don't we do, you know, Arctic exploration and navigation? We, we can go under the ice now. We don't need to surface every day to recharge batteries. Why don't we go explore the Arctic? And so in 1957, they do the first Arctic Circle run. They know they're not going to go to the North Pole at this point. They just want to go to the Arctic Circle and they want to test their systems. They get within uh, 180 to 100 miles of the North Pole. And if, sure enough, their gyro compasses and their magnetic compasses are basically useless because they've been submerged for so long. And they're so close to the magnetic North Pole that it deviates from the geographic North Pole. And it's just kind of dangerous. You can get lost under the ice and not be able to navigate your way out. So they don't want to go you know, too far towards the North Pole until they have better equipment. So they come back from this first excursion into the Arctic area and uh, they get some equipment from the North American Aviation uh, Company. They get an N6A internal guidance system used on the Navajo cruise missile. And they wanna use this navigation system, this inertial guidance. In other words, as the guidance device itself is physically moved, it maps where you are on the globe. Now, this inertial guidance is designed for cruise missiles, which fly for a short period of time, minutes, and go very fast. And they want to put it on a submarine that goes very slow and is underway for months. So there's some modifications they have to make to it to make it work because it be, in all inertial guidance systems, whether they're made in the 50s or even they're made today, they slowly get inaccurate over time. The longer you have them operating without a position fix to reset them back to their actual location, these uh, mechanical and magnetic errors slowly make your position in this inertial navigation less and less accurate. 
So that is a concern, but it's really the best option they have at this point. And so they try a second attempt to go up to the Arctic, uh, you know, in North Pole this time with this new device. But they get up to the Chukchi Sea, which is just north of the Bering Sea. They're between um, Alaska and Russia, Skamchunko Peninsula. And uh, the ice is too thick. Uh, the, the Chukchi Sea is very shallow and the ice goes almost all the way down to the bottom. Like there's no room down there to safely navigate a submarine. Uh, it's not worth the risk. So they're going to go back to Pearl Harbor and try again later. So summer comes around July, 20, July 23rd, 1958. And they're going to try the same thing again. Operation Sunshine uh, from Pearl Harbor in the summertime. Sure enough, they get up there. They can submerge. No problem. Uh, the internal navigation works this time. It, it works enough for them to get to the North Pole. And they're able to transit from the Pacific to the Atlantic via the North Pole and um, pull in to Portsmouth, England. Uh, they report... Uh, their their position uh, here in the chit you see to the right if you're watching the visual side of this and commander William Anderson who is now the new CEO of the Nautilus at this time this is the second CEO says for the United States let me quote this for the USA and the US Navy Sunday 3rd August 1958 2315 Eastern Daylight Savings Time the North Pole that's the announcement he makes over the 1MC to the crew. This is the navigation shit that they have uh, recorded for, for history. And uh, it's just a moment, another huge accomplishment for the first nuclear submarine to not only transit the Arctic Circle, but go right to the North Pole where they don't need magnetic compass to help navigate back south again. And uh, it was very hectic because the ice, even in the summertime up there, was very thick, getting very close to the, to the floor of the Arctic Circle but they managed to stay between their test depth of, of about 700 feet and still be able to go under the, the, the keels of ice that were coming down like, like little icy walls. A great accomplishment. So from here, after they pull into Portsmouth, England, they helicopter the CO over to Iceland. And from there, he gets on a plane and goes to Washington, D.C., where he meets with the president. And the president gives them a presidential unit citation uh, for him. And well, it's actually awarded to the ship, the president unit citation. Um, but every him and every crew member get to wear the ribbon on their uniform called a puck. And this is the first time a presidential unit citation has been awarded to a military vessel in peacetime. That's usually a wartime award, but this is such a significant accomplishment. They get a puck assigned to the ship. All right. May 1958, the next year. They go back to Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in Kittery, Maine, where they complete an overhaul and another refueling. So they're doing these refuelings like every two years. You know, those are not cheap. But what blows my mind here as a retired sailor myself is that they're doing these refuelings in about four months. These nuclear refuelings in today's Navy are 12, 18 month minimum projects. They can take even longer than that uh, because of all the meticulous safety precautions that are necessary to do this in a safe manner because these systems are very complex and uh, the equipment is very densely packed together and you can't just cut a hole in a submarine and rip out the reactor and put a new one in like you're changing a double a battery it's much more involved in that of course uh, but the fact that they were doing this in four months blows my mind uh, you know they did they had no incidents they had no problems there was no reactor accident uh, so that's all to their credit that they were able to do it safely and quickly. The days of doing it this fast are long gone. All right. The next year, August 1960, she's got a fresh reactor ready to go serve the fleet. She is assigned to the sixth fleet, which is uh, headquartered out of the Mediterranean Sea. She spends about four years over there, steams over 200,000 miles over that time, sees all the major ports, all the NATO allies showing off America's new nuclear submarine to other countries saying, hey, look at what we got. Nobody else in the world has this. You know, we were the first and look how good it is. And they're given tours. They're taking representatives on short underways, diving them, surfacing them, showing them the capabilities. It's blowing minds around the world. America is a dominant naval force in 1960. Uh, as part of the war games, she also served outside of the Mediterranean. Just because she's headquartered there doesn't mean she stays 
inside that little body of water. She went out into the Atlantic and did war games off the coast of Bermuda, off the coast of Spain and France. And during these war games, she earns lots of awards like Battle Excellence Awards, which is a very prestigious award for a ship to get. Uh, the crews always try to get the Battle E Award every time they get a chance. Um, they usually have a chance once a year to get one. And it's a big accomplishment if they do. And she also gets a Distinguished Service Medal, which is, I mean, that's great. So she's a highly decorated, highly capable ship. Commanded by a crew that is very well trained and disciplined. So as she ages into the 60s and 70s, the Navy has already learned a little bit about her and are making improvements to the next generation of submarine, which is going to have the albacore hall and is called the skipjack class. And then there's essentially going to be the permit class, which has was part of the thresher onto the sturgeon class in the 70s and finally the 688 class in the 80s. So as these new systems, new submarines come online, she spends, you know, the period of the 60s and 70s kind of as a research vessel. She goes back into that role of not necessarily breaking records anymore, but trying to improve on the equipment that they're using right now. So she is refueled once again in 1967. Uh, after the refueling, they do address a lot of the major design flaws. The bow is still noisy. Uh, it still vibrates, but they've addressed that by changing the shape of future submarines. They're not going to rebuild the Nautilus. They're going to just make better submarines in the future. Um, in 1974 and 75, after only seven years, she goes back for an overhaul in electric boat. That's the shipyard that built her initially in Groton, Connecticut. And there she begins a long period of testing and improving her systems. Uh, through the 70s, 1975 to 1977, she sails over 35,000 miles. That's a lot of underway time. She goes to Scotland. She does war games in the Gulf of Mexico. She does war games with Canada off Halifax. She sails down to Puerto Rico a few times. She's putting a lot of miles on this reactor, conducting a lot of research, proving herself in war games, developing the tactics that the NATO nations will use to counter the Warsaw Pact threat. She is a big part of that development. As, as the Navy is actually making better submarines, she, through her research, are making those submarines better with equipment and tactics. So finally, in 1977, she does return to the Mediterranean. She gets a, an assignment to the Sixth Fleet there, where she does kind of a farewell tour. She does the rounds of the major ports again, meeting the NATO allies and other countries as well, showing off the capabilities of this aging nuclear submarine. At this point, she's historical. She was the first. People just want to see her uh, anytime they get a chance. They do tours. They open the ship to the public while it's in port. You know, they're taking some military uh, NATO members underway to show the capabilities, just like they did years before. And it's just a great way to impress upon the world how capable nuclear submarines are. It is, it's game-changing. It's a generational leap that unless somebody does the same thing. They'll never be able to compete with us in warfare at sea again. That's how significant this is. And so she does that and then um, returns back to the States where she does her final voyage in 1979, where she goes again through the Panama Canal and um, goes to Mare Island Naval Shipyard, which is just a few miles north of San Francisco there. And there she's decommissioned the next year in 1980. Uh, after an almost over 25 year career, that has been fantastic. Her impression on naval history not only is well documented, it is incredible. It's amazing and, uh, and well, well received. So normally this is where the sub brief would end with the decommissioning of a submarine. But in this case, it doesn't end here. Nope. In 1982, only two years after her decommissioning, she's still in Mare Island. Uh, they make her, they being the United States, a National Historic Landmark for her impact on naval history. So she is now becoming a museum. So they spend about three years over in Mare Island uh, refurbishing her and making her ready for, you know, becoming a tour vessel that will be permanently, you know, tied to a pier, essentially welded, literally welded to a pier <laughs> and uh, allowed civilians to come on. They do that for three years and uh, then they tow her back to Groton, Connecticut, the, 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 the river that she was founded in, she's still there today, and she becomes uh, the Submarine Force Museum on April 11th, 1986, where she's open right now. You guys can go see the USS Nautilus there in Groton, Connecticut. 
she is within eyesight of the main highway I-95 that runs through New England. So if you find yourself in New England or even in Connecticut, it is worth a trip. Definitely get on I-95, drive to Groton, Connecticut, uh, get off on the submarine force museum exit there and uh, you'll have yourself a good time. This is a good half day visit. You can expect to spend, uh, you know, four to six hours here. And uh, the tour there is managed by uh, some civilian and some active duty people as well. Uh, so they can tell you a lot of stories of real world experiences. And there's a lot more to see than just the Nautilus at this museum. It is, it is truly a submarine force museum. Uh, but there you can see the, the USS Nautilus welded to the pier, uh, ready for tour groups. I highly recommend you take time to see her. All right, well, that concludes the USS Nautilus SSN 571 subbrief. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you in the next one.